I, as I look around, there's some people I haven't seen before. Helen is here visiting us this morning, and I don't know you. Where are you? I'm Karen. I'm Jeff. Hey, nice to have you here this morning. Thank you. This is your church now, not mine. This used to be my church. <laughs> He's visiting. Let me give you a little bit of background here why, why we're here this morning, and, and, and the topic of this class is uh, finishing well. Um, over the last, what, maybe two years, Bob, Bob Swenson here, dear friend and brother, uh, was diagnosed with mesothelioma, a very, very insidious form of lung cancer. And uh, Bob was facing uh, what he thought was end of life, and God has graciously given him more time. And along the way, he, he and Tom Cairns and I met on a number of occasions and talked about what are those things we need to do and what concerns do we need to have as we near the end. And it was through that inspiration and everything, and Bob finally says, you know what we should do? We should have a Sunday school class on this. So Amen. here we are, and our credit goes to Bob. Bob will be uh, intermixed in each of our sessions in the next six weeks, I guess. Um, on this topic, but you know, here, here's a here's a, a nasty fact, folks, that we are all mortal, aren't we? And that means what? We're all going to die sooner or later. You know, it's an unfortunate thing, but life here on Earth is a temporary condition. But life in heaven, life after death, is an eternal. Dimension. So we're here on earth for a little while, and then we're hopefully in eternity forever. But the question is, we still have things here on earth that we're, that we're doing. Right? The, our humanity is tugging at us all the time, isn't it, to, uh, to, to live life. <coughs> um, but we want to talk about in this, in, this, in this next six weeks, and, and by the way, I, I will be presenting, and Tom Cairns will be presenting, and Bob will be presenting, and Mike Richards will be presenting also over the next uh, six weeks or so on these topics. This morning, I thought we would just kind of do a little introduction and everything. Um, so the fact that we are all mortal, and, and as I look around the room, we've got uh, a lot of us who are probably in our last third of our life anyway. And we've got someone who's interested in starting well here also. <laughs> so uh, it's great. And, and for some of you other people, you may have parents that, that have end of life issues uh, you're facing. And you need to guide them through that, right? Uh, I, I did, uh, and Linda did, with, uh, with the deaths of our parents. Uh, Linda was an only child, so the responsibility felt uh, fell to us. Uh, I have a brother and sister, so we were able to share some of the things with, with my parents anyway. So what you're going to, we hope you take away in the six weeks is, is a personal application for yourself and what, what things you need to do in order to finish well, but also uh, as a guideline for those loved ones that you have who face the same issues. And Kathy, I know you have uh, with, with your mom, right? some of these very things that we're going to be talking about. And they just tug at your heart. And you know what? We're not all real prepared for that, are we? So we're going to give you some guidelines this week to kind of help you with those things. And we're not going to be able to go in depth on a lot of things. We're going to touch on subjects like living well, wills. Uh, we're going to touch on, on, on you know, many other subjects that are going to require a lot more depth on, on your part and everything. And what we hope to give you is resources, places to go to get more information. Uh, Tom and, and uh, myself and Bob would also be available, uh, you know, for personal uh, counseling or, or reflection or, or dealing with any specific issues that you have. Because in this class, we're not going to have time to do all of that, unfortunately. Uh, but we'll do our best, okay? I want to give you some statistics. Um, Linda and I have just returned from uh, Florida, and we were at a place down there called The Villages, which is 107,000 people 
all age 55 and older. And uh, we're, in the church we're in the, down there has a great motto. It's pray hard, play hard, and finish strong. And it's really kind of cool because all people in our age cadre and everything, our, our age cohort, they're in that in kind of the same situation. And the thing we find out is, is that, you know, if you stay busy, you stay active, uh, that you're going to live a lot longer and you'll be a lot healthier. But, um, how long do you think we're going to live? <laughs> what do you think the statistics are? <laughs> well, for this young lady back here on, on, on Grandma Barbara's lap, um, she is uh, statistically, according to the Social Security actuarial tables, going to live 81 years. As she gets older and, and gets various hurdles, that will increase. If you're, if you're 40 and a female, you're going to live 82 years. A male is going to live 78. But if you make it to 70, then men will live to 84 and women to 86. And if you make it to 80, men will statistically say, make it to 88 and women to 89. Why do you think women live longer than men? <laughs> Dr. Tom can uh, uh, talk about that. But the thing is, we're all going to live a long life, and, and a lot longer life than, than our forefathers did, and, and those who went before us. Um, right now in the United States, there's 308 people over age 65. That's 13% of the population. Back in 1900, it was only 4% of the population. So you've got an ever-increasing number and percentage of adults that are over age 65. So it's the fastest growing segment of the population in the United States. Most of us are in that, in that group. But while we uh, will live a long life, we never know when the end is going to come. So it leads us to several, several questions. How do we prepare? How do we prepare for this end of life time that we're going to have? There's a lot of different elements of preparation that we need to make. First of all, there's a spiritual preparation. And that's making sure that you're right with the Lord, that you know where you're going to go after your life on earth is done. There's financial preparation, right? You know, how can I retire? Where am I going to stay? How can I afford to live? Da, 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 da. There's, the, there's the preparation of our material possessions. Lynn and I have just downsized. You know, before Christmas, we moved into a townhouse. And moved from a home we were in for, in how long were we in there? 37, 36 years. Lots of stuff in that house that you need to deal with. Bob, same situation for you. Anybody else downside? <coughs> okay. All right. You have, and you know it. it's tough, isn't it, to deal with that stuff. So we'll talk a little bit about that. We also have the area of health care preparation. How do we try to maintain good health? in the last third of our life. Then we've got uh, issues related to housing. Where do I live? We go through phases of independent living, as we call it. Most of us are in that category right now, uh, to assisted living, uh, and perhaps for some into, uh, into a skilled nursing facility. So what's that all about? How does that work? Um, Kathy, I know you've done, had to deal that with your mom, right? Uh, anybody else have to deal with that with a parent? Yeah, okay. It's not easy, is it? Well, it's really not easy. What are some of the things you found in the things you went through? They don't want to let go of their memories. Ah. Of the, the home, home that they lived in, right? <coughs> they don't want to get rid of their car. <coughs> <laughs> Giving up the driver's license. <laughs> It's difficult to find an opening at a nursing home. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it's expensive. And it is expensive. How do I pay for it, right? How do they pay for it? I saw an article in the paper this week. The average 
nursing homes, 91,000 a year. A year, 91,000 a year. And some of the older ones don't want to go to the nursing home. I don't think anyone that looks forward to that. Tom and I are on the board of directors of Human Care. And, you know, it's a free church's organization that owns and operates and have senior care housing, and including school nursing facilities, assisted living, and, uh, and independent living. And uh, this is an issue. You know, people don't want to go to a, a nursing home. But statistically, uh, we all won't. And if we do, it's going to be for a short period of time, statistically. So there's exceptions to that. A long time. Linda's father was in a nursing home for six years. Six years. So, housing preparation, and, and lastly, the topic of how do I leave a legacy? What do I want to be remembered for? How do I want to be remembered? What messages do I want to pass on to future generations? Huh? Have any of you given that? <coughs> thought? Bill, you have? Yes. I guess I'd like to leave a legacy of kindness. Oh, great. We're gonna we're gonna talk about that. I mean, it's all it's all related to this whole topic of finishing well. What do you think it means to finish well? I think basically it's how you divide and use your time. Okay. For certain, whether it's family, whether it's travel, whether it's ministry, or or health and you start taking suction, there's going to be changes, but I hope you know how to uh, use your time around that. All right. But you also have any thoughts? Yeah. I know some people may be past the point of being able to travel and do things that have energy and strength, but you can still finish your work and focus on others and not on yourself. Okay. Focusing on others and not just yourself. Other thoughts on what it means to finish well? Not feeling sorry for yourself. Not feeling sorry for yourself. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. When you've done your best. When you've done your best. When you've done your best. Okay. <coughs> All right. All right. I think finishing with the Lord in mind so you know you're going to go through. All right. So you're going to go up. <laughs> Knowing that you're going to go up rather than down. Yeah, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Um, that maybe it would be to say not having regrets. Oh. But then at the same time, if there are difficult things in our past or things that we've done wrong or made unwise decisions, have them confessed, maybe re- um, what's what I want? Making it right with the individuals involved, so that there will not be regrets. Okay. Yeah. I got an announcement. I want you know to pick Sheldon. Yes. And I visited him this week, and he announced to me that he made a commitment to the Lord. Oh. Oh, oh my goodness gracious. I, I got to tell you what I know a little bit of history with Dick, Dick's uh, and, and his wife, Lou. 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 Long time uh, Crosspoint members, uh, you know, 20 years? Yeah. Lou was very much a, his wife was very much a committed uh, believer. Uh, Dick uh, is a retired professor uh, from the University of North Dakota. And Dick would come to church all the time with Lou, right? <coughs> very faithfully here. He never had made that personal commitment. We worked on it in a small group for years. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness gracious. Well, Lou passed away before Christmas, and Dick is on his own, and uh, Gosh, it would be wonderful to hear from Dick what <coughs> made the decision. What was the he announced to me at, at the hospital, but mentally he's not doing too good right now. Okay. All right. All right. Well, 
far as leaving a legacy when we're on feeling bit, I did share this with our son as the class before. But at her funeral, I heard the kids talking amongst themselves that one of the girls, the girls said, I would love the Bible. Lou was having so much wisdom and written in the Bible, and that was the kids. I think all wanted that Bible. They wanted that Bible. <laughs> something to think about Will, when we talk about leaving a legacy and those kind of things. I have, a, I have a good friend who did that very thing. Every year he would write in his Bible and do all the notes as he studied and all that sort of thing. And the idea was that he would give a Bible from each year to one of his grandkids. Wow. <laughs> That's a neat idea. Uh, another thing you can consider is uh, using uh, resources and skills that God's given you in uh, the benefit of the people. And volunteerism, uh, there's a lots and lots of opportunities out there. All right. So part of finishing well for you is using the, the gifts and the skills and the contacts that God has given you. Terrific. Terrific. And Bob has invited a friend here this morning. I was going to say... Because of his endeavor to reach me. Isn't that nice? Great example. Living example right here in our midst this morning. Thank you for being here, by the way, Helen. Um, I have assured my children and my good grandchildren that they don't have to worry about me when I die. I said, now you guys, oh no, we know, Grandma, you're going to go to heaven and be with Jesus. And I said, yes, I am because of him. And I said, and that's where I want you guys to be. So that's my biggest prayer for you guys every day, that all of us will be together in eternity. Okay. And and then one other one of my kids said, I know, Grandma, you're, and you want at your funeral, what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. And I said, you got it. So I, wonderful. Yeah, wonderful. so I, I want them to know that. Sure. sure. Well, there's another aspect to finishing well, and... and uh, uh, a friend of mine, uh, uh, never, a number of years ago, and on New Year's Eve, remember, Kevin Bergman asked me the question. He said, what do you think it means to have a life well lived? Have you heard that phrase, right? Mm -hmm. What do you think that means? I think it's commitment. Commitment? Mm -hmm. Explain a little bit more, Helen. Well, you put Christ first in everything. Putting Christ first in your life. And make sure that um, um, we have agreed the Holy Spirit in our lives. Oh. And that um, we take to his leading daily and ask for help. Good. I think it doesn't mean some of the things that we typically worry about on a daily basis and pursue on a daily basis. Like what? Some of your um, miscellaneous, I mean, boy, unless we could start a list, get to the whiteboard. Um, <laughs> you know, there's things, uh, there's health, there's miscellaneous things, your, your car, your things that happen at work that are like short term. You know, they affect your joy and they shouldn't. You know, some of the things that people said, it's like, well, it's not what they think about me, it's what God thinks about me. You know, those types of things. Okay? So it's not about material stuff. Okay. It's not about our reputation. Not necessarily. Okay. It is about our reputation. It is and it isn't. Okay. I think that um, in order to finish well, if we're talking, if we're still. My, my thoughts have gone in many directions just since we started talking about this, but we have to begin well to be able to finish well. I mean, it's a lifelong procedure. You need to begin well in order to finish well. It's a lifelong issue. I'm repeating that for the microphone. I'm going to pick that up. That's a very profound thought. Tell me, how do you, what do you mean by that? Can you explain that a little bit more? Nobody's perfect. Right. Mm -hmm. Nobody's perfect. 
Anybody here perfect? <laughs> That's in the class next door. There's more living to do than just finishing well. Okay. It's something that you build on. Now right away somebody could say, okay, so then what about the person who's had a terrible life and whatever that means. Well, I don't have an answer for that. <laughs> but I do believe that how you finish could be very well attached to what kind of the life you lived your whole life. Okay. I I had I kind of disagree with that based on the fact that I have you know a daughter that my oldest daughter who did not begin well or I mean at a one point in her life you know deep into drugs deep into the, the street life things that are just that that it all entailed but she is finishing well I, I mean I'm not saying she, she hopefully she's not at the end of her life she's only in her fifties. But she has had repentance. God has been with her. Different other people have come into her life to help her. I, I know what Annette is saying, and I, I, I agree with that. But what I'm saying is that there are circumstances, and like my granddaughter Caroline, most of you know, is I don't know where she is. She's out and about. She's probably prostituting, using drugs. But I know she loves the Lord deep down, and, and I just our prayers are that she will finish well. Okay. She will repent and back here first. Yeah. Finishing well really is in the eyes of the beholder in our lives who want it to be the Lord. My terrible life as a young as a younger woman, as a single mom, was terrible for me. But for someone else that would listen to my testimony would say, Ah, oh, that's nothing right. compared to my terrible life. So as I'm looking at finishing well, I'm saying I need to know that I've done the best that I can. If there are regrets, I have dealt with them. If I have wronged someone, I have righted it. So that today as I sit in class with all of you, you can't really judge where I came from because I came from there. Uh -huh. But I know where I'm going. And I'm standing on that promise, and I'm praying that those that have been a part of my life, young, today, or beyond, will recognize that Christ is my life. That the Holy Spirit is who I want to start my life, to finish my day. But, again, each one of us, as we go around the room, <coughs> has had a different life when we were younger. We're all going to have regrets. We're not perfect. They're next door, remember? So, <laughs> from that perspective, though, okay, um, what was terrible for me might have been just a walk in the park for somebody else. Sure. So, we can't judge one another on where we came from, because each one of us have had our own bumps in the road. <coughs> I just want to finish well today, knowing where I have been and where I want to be for eternity. Uh, Pat? Nothing well to me is a thing in God's hands and a thing in I have a friend who's 58 years old and just got diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Yeah. And he, he can't work, he can't drive, he can't do, he can't hardly do anything. And uh, I just keep reminding him that God is with you. And I have spent a lot of time with the family. Is he a believer? Not yet. Stay with him. Stay with him. Bill. This is going to be very difficult for me to say. I am a condition for the MS. I'm called pseudo bulbar palsy, where I break down and cry, or conversely, I laugh. But you and I both are coming from the same area, Pat. Many years ago, I had a combat experience where <clears throat> we started off with 186 men. And when it ended, there were four of us left. And I have had a terrible case 
Oh, survivor's guilt. Survivor's guilt. Survivor's guilt. Wondering why I was one of the four. And I have enjoyed collecting quips and sayings over the years. And one of my favorite ones says, what you are is God's gift to you. What you make of yourself is your gift back to God. And I, I mean, you guys, a lot of you guys know about this story in here, but there was a gentleman who didn't do very well. He retired at 65, and he didn't live in a mobile home. He lived in a trailer. Wonderful Christian man. And he had a very supportive wife who said, well, honey, why don't you go out and show these people your idea? And church, she would let him sleep in church basements. Somebody would fill up his gas tank. Somebody would give him a free meal at a restaurant. This guy started his business when he was 67 years old. A guy by the name of Harlan Sanders who started Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> and I guess for me though, I'm going to be 74 at the end of July. And it has only been six years for me that I am finally seeing a light at the end of the tunnel. I can see a cause where I could hear the bugles blowing. And Bonnie and I, and Mom's been so supportive, she knows that I'm really very hard at work right now. I finally figured out what I wanted to do, you guys. And I'm writing a book right now on evangelizing for the Lord. And it's coming by. Your, your title is Evangelizing? I, 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 that's not the title, but I'm, I'm writing a book exactly. about evangelizing for the Lord. Evangelizing. Life Magazine just gave me permission to use their cover of one of their most famous covers of the 20th century. I'm going to use it for the cover of this crazy book. And I have found a graphic artist lady in Missoula, Montana, who is helping me design this title. And I'm having fun with this thing, you guys. Uh, but it's the first time in my life. I mean, just, I could care less about I don't have time to watch television. But I am absolutely driven to work at this doggone thing because this is my gift back to God. Oh, wow. <laughs> A response to God's grace. <laughs> Jerry, were you going to say something? I, I kind of, what was that here? I think if, if, it, if you, this is more, it's probably, this is probably should be said more to the younger people, but we, we as adults and can teach our kids and grandkids, if you start well early, it's easier to finish well. I, I can think of I can think of a coworker right now who I respect very highly, who grew up in a Christian home and who is has his life plan, has been doing things well for his whole for his whole fifty some odd years, and he is going to finish very well. But I think, uh, you know, can we finish well if we haven't started well? Of course. God's grace is there. Rick. Uh, talking about finishing well reminds me of a, a race or a, a sporting event which has a beginning and an end, a purpose. The idea is to run the race and win, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9. But looking at Acts, at uh, David's life, a little phrase that has been on my mind for a long time as I think about now, my second half of life. For David, after he served the purpose of God for his generation, he fell asleep. So I'm asking myself, okay, what is God's purpose for me and my generation? And if I finish that, then I've finished well. So using my gifts, my opportunities, my experience, my place in life, in time and space, serving that purpose, if I do that, then I can go to sleep and finish well. And taking off on that thought, uh, we may have had plans earlier in mm -hmm. our lives what finishing well would be. Sure. And now we get to this stage in our lives, sure. and it's not the same we thought it was going to be. For sure. And well, tell me more. Well, <laughs> and I, uh, and and I, there could be two ways to react to that. You could be disgusted, <laughs> or you could be rejoicing. And me, I'm rejoicing, even though uh, this isn't exactly how I envisioned my plan to be. I, 
my wife and I thought we'd be traveling in retirement and doing kinds of things, visiting our children and stuff. Little did I realize that my retirement home that I would be sharing with 130 other people in a nursing home. And it's one of those experiences that I'm reveling in because I have an opportunity based on the relationships I've developed to continue the kind of work that I've been doing all my life. But it isn't the way I planned to end up. And I'm thankful that God brought it to me. So sometimes what we think we're going to end up doing is not where God puts no. us. Somebody else says using, using our skills, yeah. using our gifts, using the way God has created us and responding to that. Yeah. I, had, I had this grandiose plan. Bill Hamill and I were seminary friends for many years ago. And I thought at one time, and I don't mean to be grandiose, but Bill and I commented together, we prayed together, I thought that I would end up like he did. And because we were seminary buddies together. Mm -hmm. But as you can see, I didn't. And yet, Bill was so good to me at the various junctures in my life. He's been a pastor to me. Uh, when I, uh, first of all, was diagnosed with cancer uh, about 30 years ago, I was in California as a pastor. And that man, as busy as he was, picked up his telephone and called me every week in my hospital and at home and ministered to me on the phone. What a pastor. <laughs> I mean, what a great friend. <laughs> and on the flip side of that, you probably don't know what kind of pastor you've been to him, what little I know of you and your response to him, if yeah. I may say. Yeah. You know, because you do. I mean, you. You and your corny jokes and uh, and your positive attitude, <laughs> you know, with your situation, yeah. you know, he ministers to you, but it, it's it's bouncing right back. Yeah. So. But that was what God had led me to. I I thought I was going to be pastor of the churches. I thought I was going to be a district superintendent, maybe a denominational executive, and that's how finishing well was going to be for me. But it didn't turn out that way. And that's all right. By the grace of God. Praise God. Yes. Is there a, a distinction here in what you're asking between finishing well and life well lived? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. There is. I think there really is. And I think, you know. I was going to try to come back. To okay. What do you see that, what do you see that, that is the difference? Finishing well. And having a life well lived. Life well lived is the, the piece that is from beginning to near the end. And the finishing well is just the end part. Yeah. Uh, so the living is using the gifts we've been given, mm -hmm. praying as we can pray for others, give to others as we can give, yeah. use the <coughs> gifts that God has given us along the way, wherever, whenever ah. we can. And... Um, Encourage others and honor the Lord. Thank you. And one other quick comment to that. Thank you. Because one of the great <coughs> blessings that I've been given at Cross Point Church is to fit in with my gifts as pastor of congregational care and the ministry of <coughs> prayer that I have each and every week to talk to people on the phone. Mm -hmm. It's just such a blessing to me. Sure. Sure. And that's part of a life we will live. And to us. Yeah. Anybody else see some distinction? Here? So, the distinction that Tom just made, mm -hmm. I think, is where I was trying to go with what, what I said. Um, so, the part of a life well lived is mighty good preparation for finishing well. Right. So I'm not taking back everything I said. I, I, think it's, I think it's more the other way around, though. I think finishing well results in a life well lived. A component. How about life 
a life well lived to me was because my mom, the last month she was alive, she had emphysema in the last week. She could hardly, she just shaped so bad because she could hardly do anything. And yet she spent an hour writing each one of her kids a note for us to do that. I, I'm just reminded um, of two recent deaths of um, two women younger than, except for one, everyone in this room. One was, I don't know, six months ago, there was, was a gal out in the northwest part of the country who had some form of cancer. She was publicized pretty well known, had a blog, and she, um, um, what's, the, what's the word for it with a doctor, puts you, puts you down. Euthanasia. You probably remember. And then just this last what, Friday or something, that Lauren something other 19-year-old girl that mm -hmm. played college basketball. Yeah. Yeah. But she spent, or she created, what, raised over a million dollars in cancer research mm -hmm. by what she did. Now, neither of them were Christians. I'm not aware that Lauren was. At least right. it wasn't obvious in what she did. But those were two distinct types of finishes from a non-Christian standpoint. But mm -hmm. interesting to note, nonetheless. <coughs> Well, since Kevin Bergman asked me that question several New Year's Eves ago about a life well lived, what does it mean? I've asked a lot of people that question. And it's interesting the responses you get. And a lot of it is related to the uh, spiritual condition of the responder. I've had people talk about what does it mean to have a life well lived? Well, that means I got to do everything I wanted to do. I got to accomplish everything on my bucket list. I got to earn a lot of money. I got to have a lot of fun. I got to travel a lot. Uh, things like that that were very earthly centered. But then you ask others like Ruth Johnson what it means to have a... Where is she, by the way? She's place? out at the <coughs> Masonic Home. She's at the Masonic Home. She had a stroke on Monday, if some of you don't know. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, she had a stroke Monday late after, well, early evening. She felt kind of dizzy, didn't feel well at all. Oh, my. She got up to walk. She fell down. She had a blood clot in the brain. Oh, boy. Uh, she crawled, instead of crawling and getting to the phone, she crawled over to the sofa and went to sleep until 5 in the morning, and then she called Curtis, her son, and he took her to Fairview Southdale, and I saw her the next morning, and she was doing well. She can't walk very well. They suggest she goes to this interim care for, for a couple weeks. Yes. She doesn't walk well. She's strong, they said. Her, you know, she's strong, the test show. She's a little confused, but some of it could be meds and just the confusion. But, uh, Does she have visitors? Yes, yeah. she sure can. Yeah. She's had a gazillion. Right. But out at the, the Masonic. <laughs> <laughs> right down the road. Yes, and yeah. on the visitor, first floor. It was her birthday Friday, and uh, yeah. she was sitting up in a chair, and she was talking. Yeah, she was actually doing fine. Well. That's good to hear. Yeah, she turned 88 on Friday. Yeah. yeah. Oh. She had a lot of visitors. I never seen so many. <laughs> you take a number, have a time limit? <laughs> I came in the evening and I didn't have anybody then, but yeah, she had a lot of people there. Oh, yeah. Even the lady, at, the lady at the desk, when you asked her room number, she says, boy, she's a popular lady. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't have to look it up, she knew. <laughs> she just knew what it was, huh? They're calling her the matriarch. Well, I asked Ruth this uh, question. A while ago, back, and uh, what does it mean to have a life well lived? And she said it means standing before God in the final judgment, having Him say, "Well done, well done, my good and faithful servant." I thought that was the best answer that anyone gave to that question. So, thank you for a lot of us. That's what we. Well, Bob Swenson is going to share with us some biblical examples of having finished well and finished poorly. Right? Correct. <clears throat> what I'm going to do in here is just um, give some biblical examples of people in scripture and uh, how these three things 
Um, this one a couple books that were really helpful to me when this uh, first happened to me. A uh, word of explanation here is that uh, the medical community is very good at, with their technology. They're very good at giving you all the facts. But there's one thing they're, they're not very good at is giving you any more. They just drop all the facts on you and they stop. And uh, Pat and Tom were incredibly helpful to me. This is an example of the body of Christ work. Because uh, in September of 2013, I had a lifespan of 2.2 years. That's a year and a half ago. So, and uh, uh, for a lot of people, that still happens that way today. So, it's, it's uh, God has given me a place to be here. But uh, that was uh, tough to deal with. And these two guys, I, asked, I went to each of their homes. Uh, we sat down and I asked them the same type of question. And from that, we started getting together. And it's just been, it's been one of the, the best things that happened. What uh, there's two books that we're going to be uh, talking with most from here. This is one by uh, Chuck Swindoll, and it's 22 People of Scripture. And what it gives is uh, a commentary on their life, and at the end it talks about their last words. The last one in here is Christ Himself on the cross. So it, it covers them all. It's really, really good. It's deep reading. Uh, I can read exactly one of these in a day, and I need at least a day to think about it before I even open it to another one, and it's, it'll really challenge you. Uh, another one that is going to be part of my resource material is uh, Life Principles. Uh, this was a Bible study we did many years ago, and there's four books in this series, and I'm taking a lot of information from that. And last is the Bible itself. The one that we're going to start with is... Uh, Starting with King David. King David was uh, arguably the, the, the greatest king of Israel. As a young man, you, you see David starting out uh, as the youngest of eight children of Jesse. And a youth is, uh, in his youth, he spent doing uh, shepherding. Now, we just kind of gloss over that and say, well, big deal. Well, there's more to it than it sounds. Uh, shepherding. Uh, even when I lived in Montana, uh, meant being out and being away from people for multiple weeks at a time in, re in relatively isolated areas. It meant that you needed to be fairly resourceful. You had to, you were alone, so you had to make it work. It's a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week job, and uh, you've got to be willing to, if you're uh, faced with predators, you've got to be willing to deal with it because she are uh, not intelligent animals at all. In fact, they, they're, they're terrible. And uh, a lot of things uh, will scare them. They'll do really dumb things. So kind of like us, in other words. Right. Right. <laughs> so it's, it's up to that shepherd to, to really be thinking all the time. I marvel when I read this, and I find uh, Scripture tells about David killing a lion and a bear. Now, uh, think back at, at that time. Uh, they had spears, swords, and knives. Doubtful he had a spear or a sword, most likely he had a knife. And I cannot imagine myself <coughs> fighting a bear or a lion with a knife and winning. And that's the key part, he won in both cases. As we go to David's life, uh, later we see that Samuel comes and Samuel uh, uh, anoints David as the next king of Israel. And he'll uh, eventually replace Saul. But you don't see much more on uh, David until we get to Goliath. Now, this is again, uh, it's going to be fun to talk to David in heaven because it, he can fill in a lot. But I brought this little yardstick with. Now, if you read the scripture, it can tell you that uh, Goliath was 9 feet 6 inches tall. Well, I'm 5 foot 8. Now, if I put this up here and I, I'm not, I'm still a foot short of uh, Goliath right now. I mean, how would you like to go up against a guy that big? And he did. And uh, it also tells us that uh, the armor, the upper body armor of this guy was 150 pounds alone. So he had to have, been, he had to have a lot of beef to him. He probably was around 500 pounds to carry that around easily. And uh, most likely very, very muscular. And then you look at David. 
But David uh, had God in his side. God plus one is always a plurality. And it was. And with a stone, uh, Goliath fell. And it's just the most amazing story. It's one of the most widely known of, of all scripture is that story. But David uh, took it from God's point of view. Uh, that that uh, he wanted to defend the honor of God. Where everybody else would, could only see this giant. And that's the difference. David became an instant hero in uh, Israel. But I find it amazing that it didn't go to his head. And that's just uh, amazing to me. Over time, we see that Saul uh, becomes, starts with being jealous of him, and then jealousy keeps growing to the point where he's trying to kill him. And eventually, uh, that David is a uh, uh, out in the countryside being hunted by Saul. <coughs> but uh, David is in God's will, Saul's not. And eventually, Saul and his son both uh, are killed in battle. What I'd like to finish this with is looking at the strengths and weaknesses of each of these people. Because it's kind of interesting, because it reflects on the very end of their lives. The strengths that David had, uh, number one, he followed God. If you only had one strength, that's the one to have. He followed God. Uh, he was very, very good as a military leader. He was very good as an administrator and king. He also had the ability that when he sinned, and he did, he could, he would recognize it. When God convicted him, he'd recognize it and, and uh, repent. And that was one of the points that David had. Now, he also had some things that were shortcomings. And this, again, will reflect in the very end of his life. Um, number one, he had multiple wives and concubines. So that was just a common practice at that time. It's not scriptural, but it was a common practice. Uh, of the wives that he had, the one that we, we all identify with is Bathsheba. And through that union, eventually comes Solomon. Total, uh, he had 20 children. Now there's a little verse in, near the end of Kings that talks about the fact that David was really busy. He was commander-in-chief, he was uh, king of Israel, but he spent very, very little time with his children. Very little. And it's reflected in the fact that two of his sons uh, led rebellions against him and caused great, great uh, pain to him in, in his last few years of life. One of the things we have from uh, King David is Psalms. There's 150 Psalms. Of those, they identify 73 that were written by David. So, uh, we were almost half of all the songs that we have. What I'm going to do is read the very end. It's interesting that when you look at the, the last words of David, he's talking to Solomon. And scripture doesn't list anybody else that he's talking to except Solomon. Now, whether there was other people there or not, it, I just don't know. But I just find that interesting that uh, of 20 siblings, and, and then all of his wives and his concubines, you'd think they'd all be there. But scripture doesn't say anything about it. Uh, what I'll be reading here, and this, this comes from uh, 1 Kings, I'm going to leave out the middle. Now, in the middle of these last words, David lists off two different individuals that caused him significant harm. And he wants Solomon to deal with them. We're just going to skip that part because it's, it's not relevant to what we're saying. But here's what David said at the end of his life. He said, I'm going the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore, and show yourself a man. Keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes and his commandments, his ordinances, his testimonies, according to what is written in the law of Moses, that you may succeed in all that you do, wherever you turn, so that the Lord may carry out his promise, which he spoke to me, saying, this is spoken to David. If your sons are careful in their way to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. And that was the, uh, and then at that point David died. So that's that's his last uh, the last thing that he he had that he wrote.
Where's that found out? Uh, that's found in 1 Kings uh, chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. Okay. Thank you, Bob. Mm -hmm. Each week, Bob is going to uh, share with us some of the uh, um, biblical applications for the topic of, 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 the, of the week. And uh, for his hard work, he's just such a great and faithful guy in doing that sort of thing. Um, <coughs> I want to just switch gears a little bit away from that and, and, and setting the tone for what follows in the next several weeks. What are some of your end of life concerns? One thing I think about is our, is our children going to come running when we start, our health starts failing? And their business of life, ah. who's going to show up at my doorstep? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're a little concerned a little bit on some of that at, at some point, but you know. Okay. So who's gonna, be, who's gonna be there to help me? Yeah. Okay. Alright, go. You know, I I I just think more as I get older that I get a little bit frustrated that I'm not going to be able to finish everything in my life that I would like to finish. Okay. And then I start to catch myself and I think, oh, Billy Bum, just shut up. You just accept yourself and make sure you're in good stead with God. And you keep going to the best you can, and if you run out of steam, that's it. All right. Okay. A lot of people you'll talk to uh, will tell you, I'm not afraid to die. And this is sincere. But if you talk about uh, that point that leads up to that, the pain, the suffering, the loss of control, all of these issues, that opens up a whole new area. Yeah. And my Aunt Meg is not going to the nursing home. She, she doesn't want to go there for nothing. Did not want to go to the nursing home. Nothing. Nobody does, really. No, yes. <laughs> Yes, they do. <laughs> because in my situation, I found my wife working a full-time job and then coming home to take care of me, which was another full-time job, and I saw her health beginning to fail. Mm -hmm. And I demanded to be put in a nursing home oh, okay. to save her life. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm where I am. Okay. All right. Great. When, when I die, I hope it's quick. Probably don't lay there and suffer. And I, when I hear about people dying in their sleep, I think to myself, boy, that's, that's a good <laughs> my, my father had what his doctor called a million dollar death, which uh, meant that he basically did just that. He was in hospice for a few days. But interesting, I tell you another thing about my father. My, my father is obviously a wonderful man. He died when he was 94. And May 5th of 05, 5505. I remember that. But my father had never made a personal commitment to Jesus Christ. We had prayed for him many times in the years. Um, and our small group prayed for him. As many of you in small groups do, I'll bet you you all have, have, have people that you're praying for in your small groups that you get the opportunity to present the gospel to. Well, I had to go down and visit my father. He, he, he was December of 2004. Uh, he, was, he was in the hospital and uh, he had a chance to spend some time with him there. And, and, I, and I really wanted to present the gospel. I didn't know how to go about it. You ever felt that way? Especially with a family member. It's so difficult to do. So it was on a Sunday night, and I'm sitting there with my father in his, in his home in Florida. I've got a Bible sitting next to me, and I, I'm saying, Holy Spirit, give me an opening here. How do I start this, right? <laughs> you felt that same way? Where, where do I, how do I go here? What do I do? Well, unbeknownst to me, at this very time, our small group was meeting and praying for me that I would find the right words in the time. 
And I'm kind of out of the blue, my dad said, Pat, I, I got a question I want to ask you, and if you don't mind, would you tell me, why aren't you a Catholic anymore? Mm -hmm. We were born and raised Catholic. There's an opening. Yeah, there there was the yeah. opening, right? Yeah. Well, it, it was just it was just marvelous uh, opportunity. And my, my dad was really a good man. I mean, like a lot of unbelievers can be. My, my dad could not fall asleep at night without praying through this list of people that he'd be that were on his prayer list and everything. He couldn't sleep until he did that. And But it was the next day we went to the um, cemetery. It was the anniversary of my mom's death. And uh, my, my mom was born again, and we were sitting there talking in the car because my dad was just too weak to go out and maneuver his way through the cemetery. And I it just came to me to ask my dad, uh, I, I told him, you know, I'm pretty sure positive mom is in heaven and would you like to make sure that you're there too and he said he would and so we prayed the prayer of salvation and tears and everything else it was just a marvelous marvelous opportunity for him to have a positive response to the gospel so when he passed away five months later May, he had this peace about it just just an amazing thing so he had, his doctor said, a million dollar death. He said, I just, he, he just said he seemed so completely free and at ease and, and willing to accept his death. We know why, don't we? So that's, that's kind of cool. I, I watched two, both my parents die, um, one over the course of a year and one over the course of a day or two. And so I have turned around my mind for years. I want to go fast, I want to go slow. <laughs> you know, you want some time with my mom. We had multiple times to say, because they gave her three to six months and she went for a year. We had multiple times to say, I love you and goodbye. Mm -hmm. And dad was in a coma or unconscious or whatever. So that, he was 69. So that, I mean, that came out of the blue. So, I don't know, what do you want? Yep. I think it depends on, you know, how good your mental faculties are in those declining years. Yeah. Uh, Bill. Tom, could you correct me if I'm wrong with this statistic? I had in the electricity, one of my great electricians at my house. <coughs> um, I should tell you about Bob Miller for a second. Bob was the, uh, I said, uh, how many sisters do you have, Bob? He said, 11. He was the only child in 12. But Bob told me that each of us have about a volt of electricity in our body. And Ray, you were talking about us trying to choose which way we wish we could die. And I can remember seeing some people get obliterated so fast. It's my understanding that the neurological message will go from our ankle up into our brain about 250 miles an hour. But these people were obliterated so fast that I feel they probably never had the chance to even register praying pain in, in their brain. And I started to think about what you were saying, Ray, and that was an interesting point. I thought, well, how am I going to die? How would I like to die? I started to think, well, it combines with when am I going to die, that I started to think, well, that's not your call, Bill. You don't have any choice as to knowing when you're going to die. Are you going to die peacefully in your sleep? like Bonnie's dad did? Or are you going to get wiped out in a car accident? Or are you going to get ripped to shreds in a combat situation? Yeah. Just for what it's worth. That's right. Well, look, um, we're out of time this morning. Uh, over the next five weeks, we're going to talk about a lot of these end-of-life concerns that we all have. And Tom, uh, Karen, Dr. Tom, is, is up next week. Tell us, give us a little preview of what you're going to talk about now. So next week we're going to talk more about some of the medical stuff. I guess you can figure that's why I'm doing it. <laughs> um, we're, we're going to talk about what it is normal aging. What does normal aging look like versus disease? And a lot of people kind of merge the two in their minds and think, well, it's just all one thing. No. Normal aging is one thing. Disease is another. Let's talk about some of those things. And what can, what can we expect and what does that look like? And then we'll move into some of the things about
how we can prepare our bodies, how we can prepare our minds and so forth for the normal aging process and how to do it in a healthy way. So that would be kind of the broad scope of what we'll do next week. Very good. Well, thank you all for being here this morning. It's been good to be back with you all. Um, I would ask